One last time, we remember the lifeguard who became a movie star, who became a governor, who became president. And as with every storybook life, there was a storybook romance. Ron and Nancy, happily ever after, until death do us part. Once upon a time, he ruled from this place, and now our hero returns one last time. One last time, a summit with those who fought by his side and with those he defeated, and those who just want to follow in his footsteps. One last time for crowds to gather around him, thousands of faces, people he never met, but still touched somehow. Thousands of faces, all very different, all very American. One last time at Heaven's Gate before passing through. And then this storybook life ends, as many do, with a sunset and the hero riding off into it one last time. 200,000 people came here to Washington to bid farewell. Several thousand from the Delaware Valley. Some lined the streets during the procession. Others are in the Capitol behind me right now. All are quiet witnesses to history. Let's take a live look inside the Capitol building. Americans from all walks of life continue to pay their respects, filing past the flag-draped casket. It's a somber yet dramatic scene in the Capitol Rotunda. Watching all of those sights, many people from our area who wanted to be here today to be part of history. I had a chance to both stand in line at the procession and in the line to get to the Capitol and talk to many of them. The casket moved slowly to the Capitol and seemed to have a power over all it passed. So what's great about being American. They are Philadelphians, but most importantly, they're Americans who just wanted a moment up close to say goodbye. I talked to many of the people who were waiting to go into the rotunda. Some of them are still in line. I asked them what they would do when they get there. Some say that they would pray. Others said they knew they would cry. A couple of the military people, including Bob Sarp of Ben Salem, said he would just stand and salute the former commander in chief. Once that funeral procession reached the west side of the Capitol building, there was a poignant moment. I think history is going to remember Ronald Reagan as the man who said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and eventually the wall came down. But many Americans are going to remember him for the way he made us feel, proud and optimistic. And when there was tragedy, he comforted us. When the space shuttle Challenger blew up in midair in front of the nation with schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe on board, President Reagan gave an address to the nation from the Oval Office just a few hours later, and somehow, after that awful tragedy, he made us all feel proud to be Americans. So, to paraphrase that perfect speech, we wave goodbye to Ronald Reagan as he slips the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Let freedom ring. It is Independence Day here in the birthplace of America, a live look at Independence Mall, where the Founding Fathers declared our freedom some 228 years ago. Good morning. This is a special 4th of July edition of CBS 3 Eyewitness News. I'm Larry Menti, here in the city where America and independence was born. The 4th of July holiday, of course, carries a special meaning and, of course, comes with special pomp and circumstance. During this hour, the city of Philadelphia welcomes the president of a country fighting for freedom and independence, war-torn Afghanistan. The distinguished Hamid Karzai, the interim president, will receive today the prestigious Liberty Medal. Thank you. And so Hamid Karzai accepts the prestigious 2004 Philadelphia Liberty Medal like so many before him, like Valencia and Nelson Mandela come to mind. He is a freedom fighter fighting for democracy and freedom now in Afghanistan, comparing his country to America in 1776, saying they are undertaking the same battle that we undertook, a fight for freedom. We want to go right now to Arthur Klinghoffer, professor from Rutgers University, who is an expert on the Middle East, to talk about the speech we just heard. And the one thing that struck me, professor, is that he said we are going to have elections in the next few months. There was talk when he was at NATO, it was going to be September, September, September. It doesn't sound like it's going to be September anymore. Uh, yes, it appears that there's going to be some delay. But freedom comes at a price. After the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a bloody war with England followed and lasted almost five years. In Iraq and Afghanistan, they are feeling the growing pangs of freedom right now, and once again, men and women are dying. 
And so, as we remember this Independence Day, we must also remember the men who have died for freedom around the world. Freedom comes at an awful price, and we are free because others have paid it. As you celebrate today, take time to remember them. Let's take a closer look at those battleground states because that's where the candidates will be campaigning. Nevada, New Mexico, Minnesota, Iowa, Michigan, New Hampshire. And then we have to talk about the big three. Florida with 27 electoral votes. Pennsylvania with 21. And Ohio with 20 electoral votes. If one of the candidates wins all three of these states, the election is over. That person is the next president. If a candidate wins two of these states, he would most likely win. In the polls, George Bush is slightly ahead in Florida. John Kerry is slightly ahead in Pennsylvania. That leaves Ohio as the big toss-up state. Watch Ohio on election night. Last election, it was Florida that decided the election. This election, it very well could be Ohio. I'm Larry Benti. We continue now with our commercial-free coverage of the attack on America. We want to begin by recapping the incredible events that will change our lives, will change the world forever. This national tragedy began at 8.45 this morning. A hijacked jetliner slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. The crash set the immense building on fire. Thousands of workers were already inside. They had to run for their lives. The hijacked plane was American Airlines Flight 11, carrying 92 people from Boston to Los Angeles. It was an incredible sight. One of our nation's great buildings burning out of control. And this was just the beginning. 18 minutes later, cameras were rolling as the tragedy mushroomed. A second hijacked jetliner plowed into the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. Watching this, you have to be thinking, it can't be real, but it is. Flames were shooting out of the 110-story building in all directions. The plane involved was United Flight 175 en route from Boston to Los Angeles. 65 people were on board. The pilot was from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. The collision sparked a massive fire that killed countless people in the building and on the ground. We are learning today of some incredible acts of heroism in the face of certain death aboard United Airlines Flight 93. That's the plane that crashed in rural Pennsylvania. Forty-five people perished on this plane. The plane was headed from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, but hijackers apparently turned it around and were trying to crash it into a building in Washington, D.C., possibly the White House. Dina Burnett's husband, Tom, was on the plane. She says he called to tell her it was hijacked, and he said, quote, a group of us are going to do something. A group of us are going to do something. There are reports that passenger Jeremy Glick called his wife and said he and a few others came up with a plan to stop the terrorists. The belief is that there was a struggle and that some heroic passengers, possibly those two, managed to bring the plane down in a deserted part of the state, avoiding a populated government site. True heroes. say this is when President Bush is at his best, when things are at their worst, when he is one-on-one -on -one with people and victims. He was like that when he was governor of Texas and he lived in the flood-ravaged regions. Let's, uh, let's stop for one moment in respect as they lay the wreath in Ground Zero. The silence, a moment of prayer by the President and the First Lady, and now, as expected, he is going to walk among the families of the victims of 9-11. A peck on the cheek, a kind word. You were saying before that this is when he's at his best, the president. He's known for these type of meetings back when he was governor of Texas. And certainly, just a few days after nine, the 9-11 tragedy, he came to this very same site, we'll all remember, and put his arm around a firefighter and took a bullhorn and rallied the country. It was maybe his shining moment, and now he will return to one year later. This has been an unprecedented day for news both in our area and around the world. Good evening. I'm Larry Menti, live in Washington, D.C., for the impeachment debate. And I'm Tracy Davidson. And we begin tonight with the impeachment debate. It ended just about an hour ago, and we got late word tonight that Hillary Rodham Clinton will come to the Hill tomorrow to talk to congressional Democrats before they cast their vote. News 10 Steve Handelsman is also here live. He'll catch you up on the day's events. Steve. Good evening. 
And tonight we now know how some previously undecided congressmen from our area are going to vote tomorrow. Republican John Fox from Montgomery County and Lehigh Valley Democrat Paul McHale both tell News 10 they will support at least one article of impeachment. And of course, that's all it takes. Now, from Republican Jim Greenwood from Bucks County. He is still undecided tonight, but a News 10 first at four who told me he is leaning towards impeachment. Is it fair to say you are leaning towards a yes vote on Articles 1 and Article 3? Well, I, I, I would say that is fair to say. Four articles of impeachment, Greenwood is leaning towards a yes vote on one and three, lying before a grand jury and obstruction of justice. They are the two strongest. We have been sampling all of our congressmen from Philadelphia, Delaware, the suburbs, and South Jersey to find out how they're feeling today and tonight on the eve of an historic vote. Here's what they had to say. To have our government met. Here is what's next in the impeachment process. Congress will meet again at 9 o'clock tomorrow for final debate. The historic vote is now expected to start early tomorrow afternoon. If Bill Clinton is impeached, he will join Andrew Johnson as the only other president with that dubious distinction. A Senate trial of Mr. Clinton's impeachment would begin in January. Tomorrow should be one for the history books. You'll want to be with NBC 10 when our coverage begins tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Terry Ruggles and I will bring you the latest developments from here in the nation's capital and throughout the day tomorrow. One for the history books is a great way to put it. There are so many congressmen here as you talk to them tonight that say, I can't believe it has come this far. And we are only halfway through the process. If this goes to the Senate, it goes to the other side of the Capitol. The Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist comes down to oversee a trial in the Senate. It will be true drug, and that is yet to come, and that seems inevitable to me, Tracy. Tonight, the impeachment trial is over. William Jefferson Clinton is still president. The Senate will be its second ever impeachment trial by finding Mr. Clinton not guilty of perjury and obstructing justice with the Michael Lewinsky scandal. Following the verdict, the president will get another apology today. Good morning. What do you want to say? The votes weren't even close to what was needed. Ten Republican senators voted against the case presented by the House managers on perjury, so the vote there was 55 to 45, not guilty. On the charge of obstruction of justice, five Republicans crossed over. That vote was a flat 50-50 tie, well short of the two-thirds needed for conviction. And so, with the vote, Bill Clinton survives once again. It is the story of his political career, scandal, and survival. Neil Williams and then renew it. Remember this, Bill Clinton? It was his first campaign in 1992. He was the governor from Arkansas who hit the national scene with pride and compassion. And even then, scandals swirled around him. There was Jennifer Flowers, draft dodging, and I didn't inhale, and he survived. He called himself the comeback kid, but that was just the beginning. Then came Paula Jones, Whitewater, and all the gates, Nanny, Fire, and Travel, and he survived. And finally, Monica Lewinsky. This trial is over, but one has to believe the trials of Bill Clinton are not. Now he must work to repair his legacy, to try and make one more comeback for history. Thank you. 
Sports Display over Philadelphia. 2002, we are glad to see you. And to you and your family, the Big Easy Tent, a healthy and happy day. But for the tattered flag, the disasters of September were left for the nation of subconscious. Although the disaster did have an effect, it knows no one has returned home. Heroes? Heroes now deserve to be first select few. Some of them are standing fortunes who have to pull away. Protecting America and the games from terror. Sometimes the greatest success is the events we don't have. In Southern California tonight, firefighters are battling towering walls of fire. Ten separate wildfires are raging from the Mexican border to the L.A. suburbs. 500,000 acres have now burned. The death toll is up to 15 people, many trying to save their homes. About 1,100 homes have gone up in smoke. Another 30,000 are in jeopardy. 100,000 people have been evacuated. This is a live picture now from the front lines. From the air, you can see the magnitude of these fires. 8,000 firefighters are on the ground right now, working around the clock. I'm going to show you where the fires are burning. There are three main areas in the Simi Valley and around that area to the northwest of Los Angeles, San Bernardino County to the east of Los Angeles, and way down to the south in San Diego and San Diego County. This is a massive area. We said 500,000 acres burning right now. That's 750 square miles. Think of it this way. The area burning is the size of Philadelphia, Montgomery, and Delaware counties combined. Let's take a look at a massive satellite photo. This is pretty impressive. It shows you the hot sand and winds coming out of the desert and fueling these flames and blowing the smoke way out of the Pacific. And while we're up now, you can see all of the smoke coming out of the Pacific, shooting up hundreds of miles. This is all smoke and ash. Now, take a look at some incredible pictures from San Diego and San Diego County. About 600 homes in San Diego County have been destroyed. Fires are feeding on drought, dry brush. One eyewitness said it was like staring into hell. If you are just joining us and just seeing these pictures, it is quite a shock. This is what's being called the worst collapse in Atlantic City history. It is a construction project, mostly a parking garage, but a shopping facility as well. It's attached to the Tropicana Hotel. It collapsed at about 10 40 today. Here are the numbers, and they are devastating. 18 people at area hospitals being treated, several people being treated at the scene. 12 people still missing, possibly in that rubble. There are search crews right now looking for them. At this point, the Associated Press has confirmed that one person has died. There are many, many questions as to why this has happened, but right now, 
use of some movements on land and time by people who will be there to carry the flag. Is he a winner? Derek Parra is a winner. He broke a world record. But more importantly, he had been in a flower and broke a color record. Now millions of children, like Clarence and Leon students from the downhill skins from South of Belgium, have a new inspiration, new dreams. Did they win? Winning is such a sport. But consider this a hateful few trying to rip the world apart by attacking another. And now, just five months later, a celebration of world unity in America. Never had those Olympic rings been more. The world intertwined in spectacular defiance of those who invoked the terror. Some of them are standing fortress, and they're overweight, protecting the hierarchy. 